Paul Jarova calls you. Welcome indeed to another edition of the programme. Now, don't forget to remind you that, as usual, we'll be crossing the Irish Sea, travelling to Manchester to link up with Martin Logan, who will be out and about with the Irish community right across the UK once again. This week, we're in Ballinrobe Racecourse for a very, very special occasion because we're marking the 100th anniversary of this famous racecourse. And indeed, over the years, it has survived world wars, civil wars, recessions, and so many other things. It's become one of the most popular racecourses in the country. So much so that in uh, 2012, it was voted the Irish Racecourse of the Year. And that is due in no small way to the manager of the racecourse, John Flannelly. John, you're very welcome to the programme. Thank you. When you started off back in the 1990s, it was a much different Ballinroe Brace course then, wasn't it? It was indeed, yeah. I think uh, a decision made by the committee in the early 90s to fundraise in hard times for to build the now grandstand uh, was a huge decision. And everything has moved on from that. And all the buildings you see around our enclosure here. Uh, and indeed, we spent in excess of six million, including that stand, in the in the interim. John, the size of the whole area of Ballinrobe Racecourse, how big is it? We have in excess of 120 acres here. Um, it's a it's a very valuable piece of ground, and it's um, you know we've built on it over, as I said, over the last number of years, and to bring it to where it is today. Mm -hmm. uh, and a big staff as well. Yeah, we have three full-time staff, including myself, but on race days, I have in excess of 50 staff to run the whole um, race course uh, day here. You must have been delighted when it was voted the top race course of the year here in Ireland back in 2012. Yeah, well, like, you know, we're celebrating our 100 years history, so that has to be a highlight. Yeah. Um, uh, being voted uh, race course of the year, we were the first race course to win that accolade. And, you know, it was uh, something the committee here and everybody involved was hugely, hugely proud of. Now, I suppose a lot of people don't realise they turn up for a race meeting here. And, of course, people just love the horse racing here in Ballinrobe. But behind the scenes, what's involved in preparing for a race oh, meeting? As to say, how long is a piece of string, Henry? <laughs> you know, there's so many uh, people from different sectors that we have to deal with. You know, we've we've all the racing people, jockeys, trainers, owners, the, the authorities, our caterers, you know, then you, you have your customers coming in the gate, you you have bookies, you have the, the media people. Uh, so everybody wants something and you have to have everything in place for everyone. Mm. So, you know, that's, that comes with experience and it comes, we have very good staff here. So when you know what's coming, Henry, mm. you can prepare for it. Mm. Uh, but always on race days, that little extra thing will turn up or whatever. But you know, you just deal with it on the day. Now you've probably learned over your 22 years experience here, uh, to survive 100 years of horse racing here in Ballinrobe, what do, would you put that down to? Perseverance by a lot of people. Um, these guys went out in, in 1921 and, uh, and they bought it off the local landlord, Knox. And in actual fact, uh, our editor, Avril Stanton, got the actual letter that Knox wrote to the con then committee congratulating them and wishing them well, which is uh, look, a piece of history that's invaluable. But going on from that, you know, you went through, as you said earlier on, through world wars, mm -hmm. through depressions, through everything. Yeah. And, poverty, the, and poverty, a lot of poverty, yeah. at time, But the, yeah. the love of racing was always here, going way back mm -hmm. to the 1700s and before. Mm -hmm. And when you get a group of people, any group of people together that are interested in something, they will persevere and push on. Mm -hmm. And, you know, their perseverance is allowing us to do what we do today, mm -hmm. uh, to carry it on and, and to make this a better place for people to come racing mm -hmm. and for the industry to come racing, mm -hmm. which I suppose we have done over the last 25 years. And look at the future looks bright for us as well. And, mm -hmm. you know, we, we took a photograph the other night off the committee uh, and it was the centenary committee. And I said to them when they're standing there, I said, this will be in the bicentenary book. <laughs> so smile. Yeah. You know. yeah. Well, continued success here at Ballinrobe Race Course, John. Thanks very much, Henry. Uh, 
I started here when I was about uh, when I was 12 years of age. I used to uh, collect the number cloths off the jockeys when they'd be coming back in after the races and put them in their bags and get them ready for washing. So I used to do that every race meeting and I developed then on from there through the years. I'd get more roles each and each summer from cleaning out stables and eventually joined, uh, joined them on the track here when I was about 16. So yeah. Yeah. And did you have to go away to train to learn about uh, track racing? Um, I, not formally. Uh, what I did was I built up a lot of experience. I got a lot of experience before I left here as a young age. Then I um, went to Fairy House, Leperstown and Cheltenham. Uh, I had various roles in those race courses, uh, from tr everything from track maintenance to jump building to track layout. And I took it from there. I eventually came back here about six years ago and I've been full time since then here right throughout the winters. Mm -hmm. So what does your job actually entail here now on the track? Uh, what my job entails here is basically to get the course ready for every race meeting and there's a lot involved in that uh, from track layout, jump building, um, looking after all the stable facilities and grass mowing. Uh, we plan out at the start of each year exactly where each track is going to be. So for each race meeting the horses run on a fresh line of a uh, racetrack. Uh, even at a two day meeting, we change that line overnight. Um, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of work goes into that. Uh, we use GPS to plan it out. So it's very, very accurate because we're quite a tight track around here. We have a lot of uh, irrigation here during the summer, especially during the dry periods. That's very labor intensive. So we harvest all our own water here and we have our own ring main here and our own system that puts out the water. So it's, uh, it's labor intensive, but it's very precise in what we do with it. And what kind of reaction do you get from the jockeys and the owners of, with the, the racetrack? Oh, uh, very positive, very positive, yeah. Um, as you can see, the surface there, we've always complimented on our surface. Our track is tight, uh, but we have done a lot of work to to lessen the bends, but our surface is really complimented always how well it's uh, presented, um, how level it is, how good the grass is. So that all takes a lot of work and planning, um, but we've had positive feedback. We always try and work with the jockeys and trainers to, to see what they like. We always take their, their, their input and we try, we're always striving to make it better. Race track by numbers, what does that mean? Uh, well, when I was writing my piece by the book, we just have so much entailed in getting the track ready. I thought it might be nice to show it by numbers, um, just to how much um, fertilizer we use in the year, how many horses actually race on the track, how many jumps we have, how long the track is. So I just thought it was a nice way for people that mightn't understand tracks as, as well as I would, uh, just give them a better idea of, of the track. Finally, uh, preparation of a start of the season in April next. Is there a lot of preparation for that? A lot of preparation. Um, I'm often asked what do I be doing in January and February when we're not racing here and I can tell you I'd be as busy as any time of the year. I'd be in the office, you're, you're getting your soil records done, you're, you're ordering fertiliser, uh, where we've done jobs here at the start. Uh, it's back end of last season we've done a big job here where we, we levelled a, a ridge so it's always it's planning. So as the saying goes if you uh, Fail to prepare, prepare to fail. Michael, there were a lot of stables like this around Mayo, uh, which had a great tradition for horse racing. Well, not necessarily around Mayo, but in mm. the Connacht area. Mm. And uh, the main around Mayo would have been the Dailies of Loch Mask and the Moors of Moor Hall, originally. Mm -hmm. Like the Corona story, where, mm -hmm. what, that won the Chester Cup mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. fed the people during the time of the famine. That's mm -hmm. where the tradition mm -hmm. of racing originally came from, mm -hmm. in Mayo. And mm -hmm. then Ballinrobe Grace Coast, where it started and where it is now. You, so know? you have a number of horses here now, uh, and these are all being trained for racing, are they? Most of these now, hopefully, some of them will make race horses. Yeah. I'll hopefully run a few of them point to point, and, and we'll see which ones will come out and maybe mm. sell them on, some of them. Maybe hopefully get a few owners if I can. Do you know? Yeah. yeah. And some of them I just have their name in them. Yeah. You know, like the like stuff that's called card market. <laughs> then I have another one there, Battle with Time. I have one I'm calling a fellow you'd know, Tommy O'Malley. Yes, so indeed, I'm the yes. famous male footballer. Yeah, that's right, yeah. And who originally came from Ballon Robe. So yeah, that's, that's correct, yeah. That's yeah. so a few and another one, 
knock the fuhi, lock, lock, yeah. uh, all dove. Yeah. So hopefully, be interesting to see mm. what any of these even make the track. We lost a couple of race tracks, of course, over the years here. We were the Tume and Mullingarm. Ballyrobe did very well oh, to survive, the didn't it? Phenomenal. And that's where you have to give credit in times, bad times, how they held on to that track. You know, mm. that whole committee and holding on to Ballyrobe. Like Ballyrobe should be in the first place to go. You know, because that time, tradition of racing would have moved up to the Curra and down to the southeast and the south. There wouldn't have been, you know, many people involved in racing up here. And at that time, it was very things were, weren't good at that time. Come back to the come back to 60s, 70s, 80s, and even before that, 30s, 40s. You know how they held on to race. So it's a credit to them. Do you expect to see any of these horses racing in Ballon Rover? <laughs> <laughs> That's the dream, Henry. That's the dream. <laughs> to get. It's very competitive at the moment. Very, very competitive. And I don't, I'm not in the centre of racing. I'm not. When I went and got my trainer's licence at the time, I remember I went into this short turf club and your man said to me, a tra in Mayo, Bell and Robe. Are you mad, he says. If he says the trainers can't survive up here in the Curra, how are you going to survive down there? I says, Bell and Robe is my home and Bell and Robe is where I'm staying. And Great. I says, we'll see how it goes. And I've been at it now a lot of years. Great. But and you continue? I continue as mm. long as I'm able to, mm. and I enjoy it. It's mm. not now, you don't make any big money in it, mm. by any means, but like football, it's a great interest. Mm. And, and you're still involved with the race course as well? I'm still involved in the race course on the committee there. And uh, hopefully we'd see one of these horses in Bell and Robe at some stage. It would be great. Mm. Paul Chirash, you're very welcome back to part two of the program. Well, to mark the 100th anniversary of the race course here, a book has just been launched called A History in the Making, and it's certainly a good read for anybody who has any interest in horse racing. Some fabulous facts, figures, and wonderful photographs in it. So we attended the launch here at the race course. When you got involved with this project through your work at the Ballon Rope Historical Society. That's right. Um, John Flannelly asked me to come involved because I had produced a few books prior to this. One in particular on the Harry Clark windows here at the church in Ballon Rope. A marvellous collection. Little secret. Um, so they felt that they needed somebody who might have the history as an introduction, say, to the book, leading into then uh, the rest of the variety that we brought on board like having um, input from various people who were involved with the races over the years having a, the, the course and the development of the course again over many years and uh, included and then the people who actually physically did the work on the grass on the ground because without them we wouldn't have had a race course. During your research you found out that this whole area not just Ballon Robe well, there was a great history of racing in this area. There was. You see, the ascendancy classes would have always raced. But before them, the Normans were racing. We forget that these things happened like centuries before that. And right through, uh, Cromwellian times put a stop to it because uh, they didn't want uh, uh, racing or they didn't want betting or and they stopped all the racing. And uh, that then developed again when James, one of the king, James the first, came uh, on board and he loved uh, the hounds and the racing and the following of it and then it developed from there on and all around Ballon Road. And also there was a, a military establishment here from the very, very late 1600s, like 1699. Uh, and there were 80 horses stabled at, at the infantry barracks in Ballon Robe, which was a huge number of horses. And the spin-off from that in the area was enormous too, because a lot of people were employed with, you know, the harness makers, the saddle makers, the shoe makers, the, all the various people who would have contributed to uh, um, horses and the well-being of horses plus the um, racing in the area. George Moore of Moore Hall was a steward at the Ballon Robe races. He went on to have a fantastic win didn't he? That's right at the Chester Cup and uh, he um, gave some money towards 
the upkeep of the farm, his own farm people during the famine. So, like, that's a nice story that was attached to the, to the race course, the fact that he had been a steward. So the Corona restaurant was called in his honour. So there's lots of attachments to the history, to the years. I know during your research, you came across a note, a handwritten note from the 1700s. That's right, that's right. 1773, I think it, it was recorded that there was a seven-day meeting in Ballinrobe. That was a huge amount of racing and all the ancillary things that happened around it. Like there were multiple marquees around the place people entertaining their friends and their families. There would have been markets, there was bartering, there was even a, Liz, a touch of the Liz Dunvarna matchmaking, um, all sorts of competitions for butter making, lace making, lace making, and an, a, a great opportunity for, the, for society in general, both the aristocrats, the regular professional classes, and all of the other people involved. They were all meeting up and it was a huge event and very popular. <laughs> now, can I find just to ask you, Avril, the hundred years now of Ballon Robe racing, why do, you think, why do you think it's sustained the racing all those years? I think it's the common touch. Anybody I meet at other race meetings say they love Ballon Robe because you're mixing. There's no elitists kind of... Uh, yeah, you meet you meet everybody, and everybody talks, and nobody kind of impinges on, say, famous visitors. They have a look and a smile and whatever. But I think everybody kind of feels it's a very friendly um, meeting. Plus, it's sustained by the people of the West. They're the ones that come year after year after year, the loyal punters. So I think you can't say any more than that. They are the ones that have sustained the course and the success of Ballon Row. In the book, uh, History in the Making, Ballon Row Race Course, 100th anniversary, um, of course, your family go back that 100 years. They go back the 100 years. They go back, John Staunton would have mentioned 1921 when my granddad, Patrick Stephen, was in it. And he was in it for years. And then my uncle, Bernard Daly, came in as secretary and chairman. My father was a vet on the course. And then my uncle John had a couple of horses here, like the problems, final problem. So that's it. And I suppose I'm the bloodline, third generation, but about the fifth or sixth involved in some way. And then my cousin, Alan, he trained horses. And then his wife, Gwen, rode here as well. So there's a bit of tradition in it. Yeah, yeah. And did you always want to become involved in, in the Ballon Rover race course here? Is it something personal? With it's like Anthem. It's personal because it's a tra tradition is the wrong word, but it's kind of cultural. And like horses I love, and I know I don't have any, but I do love them. I love the race course. It's a kind of community. There's a great atmosphere inside this place when, when the events are on. It's lovely just to watch people enjoy themselves. And you just want it to go on for generations to come. Have you ever done any of the racing yourself? No, not racing. I did when I was a kid. I used to do hunting and breaking horses like Daddy used to. We had a half bread inside in the stable and he said, come on, we'll bring it out the back of myself. My sister went out the back under an arch out of the back garden and the two horses decided you're not staying on top of us. So I landed on my knees with my two hands and I prayed and I don't know, God turned me around. And, and just finally then, uh, the, the, this evening now, very, very important yeah. evening to mark the 100th anniversary year. It's a great day, not just for Ballon Road, but for the committee as well, because yeah. they put a lot of work. It's fantastic, like, for, it's fantastic to see John, whose grandfather was there, my grandfather, but it's grand, great to see John still in good health and his wife Avril involved in the whole thing. And then Peter was another generation involved in it. Right, so there is that history. There's also Ken Murphy and the Murphys before that. There's, there is a total tradition. You know, Martin Jennings isn't here now tonight. Another, another trustee. Like it is a fantastic facility, and it is great for people. And for and years to come. for all the crowds coming back again next break. Oh, can't wait, can't wait. It'll be lovely to see you again. John, it's a very personal story for you because your father was a found, one of those founding members of uh, Ballon Robe Race. It was indeed, and there was very few of them. There was only maybe four or five who eventually signed the lease of the lands to raise the funds to buy the land. They bought the land, developed the race course, and on the 2nd of October 1921, they had their first race meeting. 
Uh, and you became eventually you got involved obviously father, father, your father's footsteps my dad was chairman for quite a number of years well I, I, I'm involved myself since sometime in the 60s as a, a committee member but I eventually became chairman sometime in the 80s don't ask me what the it was now but yeah. I'm a long time there now I'm past my cell by date yeah. and you've seen dramatic changes oh, dramatic in the race course dramatic here dramatic over the years the world because it wasn't until 1988 when we opened the new stand that was massive for the race course, for the racing community here. It was an achievement beyond belief just to have that big new grandstand there and people appreciated it. And from that day on, we uh, had one development, big developments after another. We had a new wear room, a new restaurant over the rear room. We had a um, new tote building. We had a new uh, joining up of the back of the stand to the tote building, which we call the Mask Pavilion. That gives shelter to people on nasty days. And you get some nasty days when you're exposed to all the elements here. And in there, you can have a bet on the tote, you can have a drink in the bar, and you can watch the racing on television. That was a huge, and that was the brainchild of our local member, Michael Flannery. Mm. And it was an absolute tremendous success. And then we had, uh, we extended the racetrack, added another eight acres of racing surface. We uh, had a new entrance building, which was massive, a big two-story building. The people had to come through, and it was really impressive for race course, because they came into this absolutely kind of very well designed entrance hall where they were could get race cars they could pay for their tickets and it was really a, a, an amazing feature for race course they hadn't been used to it they were used to kind of going through a gate or a turnstile but this was a kind of a, a luxurious welcome to the race course and people were impressed is there anything that you haven't achieved that you still like to achieve here at the race course as your tenure as chairman? Well, obviously there's loads of things, but the major changes have happened. With the stands, the wear room, the restaurants, the entrance hall, the new entrance itself from the road, from the Castle Bar Road. Yeah. That's huge. Yeah. It makes a big impression on people arriving. They want to kind of say, well, this is something else. This has to be good. It creates, like, first impressions. They're so important. And... In comparison to the old entrance, there was no comparison. It was just beautiful, the new entrance. And it was difficult to achieve because of roads, authorities, and planning permissions, and all the rest of it. But eventually we got there, and I think it's, it's very, very nice. And finally, how are you, how are you feeling now, 100 years on of Ballon Rover races? I'm glad I'm not 100 yet no. now, but it's great to be celebrating the 100th birthday, you know, uh, in, in this very difficult year and last year as well and there was racing with no no spectators no crowds but thankfully we seem to be coming out of that problem and we look forward to the next 100 years with great enthusiasm thanks for joining us john yeah, it's a pleasure thank you very much congratulations once again to ballon Road race course on their 100th anniversary what a great achievement and here's to many more great years of racing popular track. So until next week, slong of old.